if you look right under your your zoom webinar then you you can see that the, there is the q a session and this, there is the chat session please feel free to type in the questions that you have there because then we can ask the presenters these questions that you have asked and then they'll have the chance to answer you uh, do not shy off by not typing in and if you feel like it's a very long question then you also you also feel free to send us an email uh, this session will be recorded just so you know and this is just for us to it will be uh, posted in different uh, that, that tableau data farm areas and uh, we will make sure that uh, those who those who speak will also be recorded uh, and then uh, if you have any difficulty hearing or you know just something uh, that does not work just restart your computer it has just happened to me right now so just restart your computer everything should be up and running so right now i'll start by welcoming morton bo Daubo from uh, he's a bi consultant from uh, bo olufsen welcome bo and i need to unmute myself i guess uh, hi guys my name is morton um and i will be presenting a bit on sets and parameters and some of the new features and how to use that um I'll start by sharing my screen, I guess. Uh, and it will be mainly Tableau. I have a few slides um, just for remembering stuff. Um, and I will, at the end of the slide deck, there's also a link to my Tableau public where you can download the workbook that I'm using here. Uh, it also contains actually the main points from the slides in the Tableau workbook. So you don't need the slides uh, other than for my presentation. Um, you will notice that I'm using the Inspari PowerPoint deck. It's not because I am from Inspari. It's just because it was the best one I had available and they were nice enough to let me use it. Uh, so, uh, so I prefer using that. Um, yeah. Okay, my name is Morten. Like I said, I work at uh, Bang & Olufsen, which is a luxury high-end uh, audio and television producer. If you're Danish, you've probably heard of them. If not, then too bad. I hope you have. Um, and uh, I actually have my last day with BNO tomorrow. Uh, and after that, I will be joining uh, Region Midtjylland, uh, which is one of the Danish, the five Danish regions where I have gotten a new position as a BI dev. Um, I've worked with Tableau for seven years, I think. Uh, and uh, today I will be talking mainly about parameters and sets and how we can use them and, and how we can build the uh, funny inter interactions with them and useful interactions with them. Yeah, um, and that's me. If you have any questions to me or just want to, you know, uh, link up or talk or whatever, uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is pretty unique. You should be able to find me. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, before we get started, I know that uh, not all of you are on the same version. Uh, so I just wanted to give a highlight here on some of the things we will be talking about today and where where you are on your version uh, basically decides uh, how much fun you can have with this. Um, I think you should be 2018.3 at least for any of this, for most of this to make sense and preferably uh, 2019.2 or 3 uh, is, is where it's really uh, necessary. However, 2020.2, uh, which I am on right now, uh, brings in some really, really nice uh, features, especially the set controls feature, which I will be showing as well. Um, so like I said, get your buck, your Tableau admin and get them to upgrade your guys uh, because there are really uh, many things to, uh, to go and get in those versions. Okay. If you want to download a specific version, you can always use uh, this link. This is uh, an old link. I guess Tableau allows you to download multiple versions now. That wasn't always the case uh, back in the day. Okay, um, yeah. And we don't need to go any more slides. So that was the slides uh, that are funny. I guess I can see like this, so I can also see myself. Okay, so what we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be going through a series of examples here. Um, where I will be switching between using sets and parameters mainly and actions to drive a series of interactions, right? It will be a relatively boring setup, meaning that it's typically two charts or three charts because I'm more about showcasing the possibilities than having to build a 15 very nice looking dashboard where the interesting part in this case will most likely be the functionality of it. 
Um, so the first thing uh, I will be showcasing is how to do uh, sorting and how to do, do differentiated sorting uh, within lists like here. So in my two uh, visualizations, I have a chart to the left, which is sorted by something called a sales rank. And then I have a scatter plot of the same customers to the right. And what I want to do is be able to bring highlighted customers from the right to the top in the left slide. So when I select something over here, I want to bring my customers to the top. As you can see, this is what happens, and I'll dig into how it works. Um, first things first, uh, we have this one in here. It contains, uh, of course, the customer name, which is we see here, and then the rank that has been calculated on, as a table calculation. The way this works, the magic here is that I have a hidden set. Uh, where's this one? I have a hidden uh, set dimension uh, all the way to the left. So when I when I activate my set, it defines some customers as being within the set and some customers being outside of the set, right? Because it's a table calculation that's been set up properly, it keeps it re it retains the uh, ranking. So we can easily see when we select these four customers, where do they actually fit in within the total ranking of this uh, long list of customers, right? Um, so uh, I have a set on my customer called customer sorting set, which you see here, I guess. Where are you? Customer name sorting set, perhaps. Name sorting set, yeah, sorry. Which is just a regular set that's just been made on all customers. There's no magic to this. It's just a use all set. Um, and then I have an action on the dashboard itself, which allows me to update. When I click on something in the scatter plot, it defines the set and it assigns the values that I select to that set. And then when I unselect it, it re-adds all the values to the set. So this is the, the typical setup you would also see on, uh, on filter actions. So it's quite uh, straightforward. You select something, it goes into the set, the set is brought to the top, you deselect something and it resets. Now I've chosen for the color to change here as well. That is obviously mainly for demonstration purposes. That's not a necessity, but uh, you do you on uh, how you prefer to do it. Okay. So that was, uh, that was the first uh, little thingy uh, we can do with sets. Now we can also use sets for sorting in multiple dimensions. So sorting both the, uh, um, on, this uh, on rows and on columns, basically. In my case, I'm going to use it here to sort colors or um, categories, right? So the one visualization we see down here is just um, sales as a percentage. Uh, of the total sales, right? The problem with this is that these uh, these categories are sorted uh, alphabetically, left to right, and there's no there's no use for me if I want to compare uh, how well any given region is doing within any given category. But I can fix that because I have built some functionality that allows me to sort by any of these colors and also bring whatever I'm sorting by to the left, allowing me an easy way of comparing length of the leftmost bar. It's very hard for me when I'm doing this to compare the length of the blue bars, but it's easy to do with the red bars. So therefore, I'm, whenever I want to sort by something, I always want to move it to the left where it shares a common baseline, right? Uh, I've showcased the set down here just to basically see what happens when I click these. Uh, and there are two things to this uh, little trick. The first thing is, of course, to get the sorting uh, on the rows right. And for that, I have basically calculated something I call sort sales by category. So I can find that one here, which basically just states that if something is within the set that I'm using, which I call 2D category set, then I want the sales, otherwise I want nothing. So it's basically just keeping all numbers except the, the ones that are being sorted on relevant. So I just calculate, this one here just calculate the percentage for whatever is selected. I can probably show it here. That makes it a lot easier to understand it. So you see, if I click something here, my measure to the right basically eliminates anything but what is selected, right? 
So that's how we get it to sort on the rows. Now getting it to sort on the columns is a different uh, measure or a different uh, approach. We still have our category on color, which is sorted by another calculation. Now this calculation basically just takes anything within the set and then adds a space in front of it. Because when you sort something uh, with a space in front of it, it always goes to the top. Uh, now Tableau for some reason always puts what's on the top to the right. So I had to do a little weird sorting shenanigan. I think this is done as a descending sort, which is counterintuitive, but uh, it works. And you can see it specifically if I put this one here, here you see that furniture has a little space in front of it so if i or not whatever i choose gets a little space indented in the front so it moves as the first in an alphabetical sort right so i am with this i can sort both uh, this angle and also move my whatever color is selected to the left it even works if you do multiples so now you get the total of these two being sorted and then they are sorted within themselves using an alphabetical sort. Yeah, um, this can also be achieved by using a parameter instead of a set, but it has some delimitations. The biggest one being that you cannot actually reset it the same way you would with a regular set. So it doesn't fall back to being sorted um, normally or default within Tableau. So this one, if you want to use this method, you can see the parameter to the bottom changing. If you want to use this method, then be aware that it will always be sorted by one of these in this uh, top to bottom uh, ascending uh, sort. This is done again using a parameter action and simply just uh, concatenating. It actually shouldn't concatenate. That would be weird. It should only just give uh, whatever you select because if you concatenate it, it doesn't really do anything for you. Yeah. So this just gives you the same kind of interaction without being able to reset it. Okay, cool. I'm hearing no comments, but I guess you guys don't talk over me. That makes sense. Um, the next uh, little example we have is one where we can compare um, we can compare states. So I can select something in the left and in the bottom, I will get a calculation that is basically what is the average sales for whatever states I have selected. And I can use that in a measure to basically compare the average of whatever is selected against itself again. So if I choose Virginia, you would see that obviously Virginia is not different from Virginia, but Michigan is a bit higher and so on, so on. So you can basically create benchmarks or dynamic benchmarks of specific uh, dimension members and then compare them against the total, uh, basically the total um, outcome of these dimensions. So. The way it works is uh, relatively simple. Um, whenever you select something on the left, it filters, it puts itself into, again, a set. In this case, it's called a state comparison set. And you can see I have set this one to uh, assign values to the set uh, not, and to keep the set values. So it doesn't reset itself when I just release the selection. I can always control A and then get the full selection again. But um, the way it works over here is again with a simple calculation. So you have a calculation called difference by selected state, which is the sales from the, that is the, the baseline sales of the state minus the average sales for all states in the set. Uh, this might look a bit complex, but it's actually not that bad. It's just the sales for the selected state divided by the number of unique states selected. So I've selected, let's say I have a sales of 200,000 and I've selected four states. That gives me an average of 50,000. And then I say whatever sales, for instance, California have minus these 50,000 gives me the difference. Uh, an example could be if I find something with around 60,000. You see the California has 408,000 in difference, that matches up pretty well with the 457,000 we see in this chart to the left. Um, this is still done using sets. Um, I have an example here, I'll just skip this, but this is the same, it's just using it for indexing instead. So you wanna do basically index 100. Uh, so whatever is your index, it could be a target instead. 
uh, say my target is that I want to see everything compared to these six or seven states, then you will figure out where do they lie on an index hunter scale. And um, this is something that at least I'm often asked to, to index something uh, against something else. So we can do that as well with sets. The ca calculation is a bit more complex, but that's just because calculating the index is, uh, is a bit harder. Yeah, okay. Um, sets and parameters uh, are really cool, but I really like the new introduction of set controls because it allows us to begin actually removing the thought of using filters and begin using sets more, which gives us more control about uh, of what we want to do with our selections in our visualizations. Um, I've made a simple chart here, which again allows me to select states, and then it allows me to basically define what I want to do with that selection. So in the bottom, you see I am doing a filter of the things selected, which is why I keep the blue color. So this one down here, is filtered to these six or seven states I've chosen. And the one to the right keeps all the information in terms of sales and then just puts the selection in as a different color. So you get this proportional brushing effect on this chart while you get the full filter on this chart right here. Now, the thing that was introduced uh, in 2020.2, which I really, really liked, was the new set controls, because that allows us to treat sets like we would normally treat filters, meaning, meaning that it gives us this uh, drop-down menu. So while we can for, uh, play around with our set in the visualization, we can always also just say, okay, I actually just want Alabama and Arizona and Arkansas, the three A states, I just want to select those and we see everything update accordingly. So with this, we now have multiple ways of interacting with sets. And I know that at least from my uh, previous uh, jobs and also my current job is that you cannot understate the value of the dropdown uh, because it allows the search and it just gives um, a very understood, standable, and very common interface, which many people are also familiar with from Excel and so on. Um, so, so it really cannot be understated, at least in my opinion, how big of a change this is. It seems pretty mundane, uh, but actually uh, for me, it's, a, it's, it's what, what basically brings sets from this very niche case to something I probably want to use all the time now. Um, I also, uh, like the new uh, feature called, it's called incrementally add or remove members. And the way that works is that you can, with visualizations, you can actually incrementally do it so that when you select something, it doesn't redefine the total set. It just adds the selection to the set or removes the selection to the set. I mean, this is not a nice example the way I did it here, but you can see some really cool UI uh, stuff where you basically allow users to do stuff like this, where you say, okay, you, I know you selected these five or six states, but can you just take away Illinois? And again, by using set actions, it removes it from the set. Um, let's look at the action setup. So there are two things here. The one here that I call add to set, which is the one that is uh, present on this bar chart which basically just that defines the set. So whenever I select something up here, that defines the set. And then I have an action on the little pop out sheet I have over here, which removes values from the set, but it doesn't do anything to basically what's called clearing a selection. So I can click here and I can clear a selection and it doesn't manipulate the set. The same goes from over here. Clearing a selection does not manipulate the set. So you can play around with these set controls for a long time, uh, and you can basically find whatever works for your organization. Um, I really like this select and do nothing, where you then have the drop down available for fine tunement, or you can have uh, this listing available for fine tuning. I, like, I prefer the drop down, to be honest, because this one allows me to remove things, but I cannot add things. So if I wanted to be able to add things, I might have to create two set actions on the menu where I could 
pick something and add or remove it to the set. I think that gets blurry. So, uh, so personally, I will probably be using a combination of these selections and then this one over here to either clear the selections or manipulate it further than what I can easily select. Yeah, okay. Um, if you don't want to dabble in sets because the syntax, uh, when you have to deal with sets in terms of uh, order of operations, it might become uh, challenging. It might be, if you want to do a lot of level of detail calculations, you might have to reconsider or have to think more about what you're actually doing because sets are evaluated at a higher, uh, earlier in the evaluation hierarchy than parameters are. Uh, you can do some of the things I did here with parameters. Um, basically, if you want to do a multi-selection in parameters, you can uh, use the new concatenation feature of parameters when we talk about states. So you can see here to the top right, I have a state parameter which will concatenate my selections into a string. Now, in order for me to fish out each individual set or in order for me to compare the parameter with the dimension, uh, I have created, again, a calculation which does that. So this one tests, because I know the concatenation will always add a comma and a space, I'm basically saying take the state value plus a comma and a space and check that against the state. And the reason I do this is because, let's say you selected something called York and New York is also a possibility in your in your dimension. Then New York would also be true because New York contains York, right? So you really need to add this uh, little concatenation um, uh, extra fields, the comma and the space, to make sure you only get positives when there actually are a, a, a pure match. Now this doesn't work for the uh, last. Uh, the last part of the uh, of the parameter. So you are, if you're selecting seven states, then the the last one in the list, this one doesn't work because it does not get a comma space. You can see this uh, if you take this and scroll all the way to the right. You see Virginia would not match because it does not have a comma and a space after the selection. So that is basically just fixed by the last part of the filter uh, or of the calculation, which just basically looks at the string uh, from the back, finding, uh, finding the matches there. So I have a, I'm testing the string forward and backward, and then basically finding my, my, um, my selections and match them. And that uh, calculation can be used in relation with all other kinds of calculations for whatever you need this multi-selection to do for you. So that's uh, two ways of doing it. Um, we can't, uh, we can also use this kind of uh, these new functionalities to create um, updatable measures or create um, these kind of uh, dynamic reference lines that I have done here. These two selections, these two reference lines, represent the average of all these customers. Um, but it is easy for me to basically be able to select any subset of customers and recalculate the reference lines based on that selection. You will notice that it does not reset because I am using a parameter for this. So if you want to reset, I need to do a control A, which is a full select. Um, again, the actions are pretty simple. You select something and you point out the parameter and tell it what field you want it to update it with. Um, on the sheet itself, you simply specify two reference lines, one being the sales average parameter, the other being the profit average parameter, which are completely standard uh, float parameters. And as you can see here, because I don't like putting actions on sheets, I prefer doing it on dashboards. It doesn't do anything as long as I'm in the sheet because there's no action on the sheet itself. But on the dashboard, the two actions that I've defined helps me move around uh, the reference lines. You could achieve something similar using a set technique like I did earlier. I just honestly didn't want to um, to, to redo this as well. Um, but the kind of, uh, kind of functionality is still there. And then finally, uh, the last thing I wanna, I wanna showcase here is uh, you can go all out and you can build your own little uh, kind of pivot model 
where you put uh, measures and dimensions on it completely dynamically. So you can always choose and switch between any measure you want. And you can do the same with dimensions. So you can basically flip between all these kind of things. This is again achieved using two parameters, one for measures and one for dimension, and then using two calculations, um, one for, or actually there are four calculations, I think. Um, this one here, the dynamic dimension calculation, which gives you the rows, which is just looking at the parameter and defining, and the other one for the measure, which does the same, but for the measure instead. Um, in order to build these selectors that I have up here, which are two sheets, uh, I had a little cheat sheet, which just contains uh, profit quantity sales and the three dimensions I want. It's just a little uh, Excel spreadsheet that looks like this. So it doesn't do anything. It just contains the things I want to be able to put in. Uh, I know this would always, this has always been doable by just using regular drop-down parameters. I just really like this interaction that you can have and this little, these little visualizations with the little check marks that shows you what you have actually selected. And I know it could be done much more beautiful than what I did here. Um, the actions, again, pretty straightforward. You can update the dimension by on the dimension sheet. You basically just choose whatever the dimension you want, uh, parameter you want to hit with your selection, what field you want to put into this parameter, and whether or not it should be aggregated. Um, for this, since I'm only setting a single uh, value, it cannot aggregate, it does not aggregate. Okay, cool. Um, I promised that the slides would be in here, meaning that the, the text that's uh, necessary to actually read is uh, in the last uh, little dashboard in this workbook, which is uploaded on my Tableau public profile. Um, just want to round off by saying that there are my, my own golden rules is that if you want to only select with a single dimension value, if you don't want to select more than one, I would always use parameters myself. If you need to be able to reset your selections, I would use sets. And if you need to be able to select multiple dimensions, it can vary whether you should use one or the other. And personally, I believe that the parameters are simpler to work with in terms of the order of operation um, thing for Tableau than sets are. But I am not afraid of using sets because I uh, think I myself have a pretty good grasp on this. And uh, I would encourage anyone who is struggling with uh, with sets and parameters and to really uh, to review that because it's a good place to start. And I think I spent my 20 minutes and some. So I think that's me. Hey, wait, do I have the link here? Yeah, there it is. You can download the, the workbook from here. Okay, that was Mortenbo. Thank you very much. That was Mortenbo from Bang Olufsen. And congratulations with the new position. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like this corona time is even better than ever. Everybody getting better jobs. Anyway, uh, I have not received any questions for you, but I'm hoping our, our attendees would maybe send us questions later on. Uh, just one I have question. a question, actually. Yes, thank you. Yes. yes. Uh, well, it's maybe a bit more of a general question, but when you start building new features and getting new features and having access to new features, how how much time and effort you spend on kind of teaching your, how much do you have like your end users in mind? Because obviously if you're not used to working with some of these more dynamic and interactive sets and parameters, how do you kind of get your end users to start using them and know how to use them? It's a good uh, it's a good question. Um, I think one of the best ways of doing this is to in whatever business context you have. Uh, so there are many new features with any new version of Tableau, and some are more relevant to your to your business than others. I usually find the three or four that I think these are really game changers, and then I will build some business relatable. Uh, use cases around that to say, okay, someone has actually once asked me this very specific question or someone has been dabbling in doing these kind of interactions but have failed short or it was extremely complex to do it. And then I'll say, okay, now we have this feature. This is what how we can do it now. And this is basically the value it brings to the table in these kind of discussions. 
So how to how to you need to show how to apply whatever new features are added and why it, it matters because I mean like I said set controls it allows you to add sets and remove uh, add and remove members in a set from a list like why is that a big thing because it sounds extremely mundane but actually for me personally I think it's 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 huge and it's something that will perhaps uh, basically remove the need for um, what's it called uh, for using quick filters I would probably use sets much more because I never know when I want something that looks like a filter to act like a uh, um, like a brush or whatever mm -hmm. uh, something to that doesn't filter uh, data just highlights whatever is selected. So I think that's uh, that's one of the ways to go about it. And uh, just one last question. Uh, why why would you consider set controls uh, a game changer then? Would that be because you'd like to... Uh, Sorry, can I get the question again? Why would you consider set, set controls to be a game changer? Uh, because I think beforehand you couldn't interact with sets from a drop-down menu. Yeah. And honestly, uh, my usually the way I do it, I I will have filters that are um, that are actions, but I will almost always also have a filter as drop downs um, because for users, it's it's a good way of resetting whatever selections you have and basically also showcasing what has been selected, um, and that was not possible with sets in any like very compact way, and it is now with this uh, set control. It's some, like I said, it's extremely mundane. It's just a drop down with the values of the set. But for me, it's a huge game changer because it allows me to basically use sets the way I would use filters uh, and make sets act, since sets can act as both filters and anything basically you can come up with in a, in a calculation. I think it's huge. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much for your answer and thank you very much for the presentation. That was Morten Bull from Bang Olufsen. Uh, and uh, now we are moving to our next presenter called Andrea Machich, and uh, he's uh, very well known for his abilities in Tubble. And right now he's going to uh, share with us all the new stuff in Tableau 20.2 that we could actually apply. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this too. So welcome Machich and uh, you're welcome to take over. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Morten Bu, for a great presentation on set actions and uh, set controls. And uh, so the, my name is Andrea Matric. I'm a sales engineer at Tableau. I'm based out of Stockholm. I cover the Nordics and I work with our enterprise accounts. I've been with Tableau for a year and a half. And uh, so the topic of today is what's new in 2020.2 and a lot, to be honest, a lot is new. But uh, there are a couple of things that Morten Boo mentioned that are game changers as well. And there are a couple of things that will make you think and uh, have to rethink how you're doing things in a more productive and better way. And I taught today, so there's like tons of features in 2020.2, but I will cover relationships. Uh, we will talk about a quick recap on what Morten Boo did. So, so uh, set actions and controls, S3 integration, which is, which is really exciting. Uh, metrics, that is a totally new uh, content type inside of uh, Tableau. And then uh, upload the workbook and a couple of small new features. But besides of this, there's like a ton, new, ton of new uh, features in uh, 2020.2 but these are the ones that I will spend most of the time on. And if we get any time uh, at the end, I might cover even more. So <clears throat> in regular fashion, uh, Tableau, we try to avoid using uh, PowerPoint, but we want to show what we actually have. And before going to relationships, I thought I'll just cover the, uh, the current state of Tableau and uh, how we work with data. So, in front of you or in front of me, uh, we have the uh, a data set with uh, London population and we have uh, boroughs uh, or uh, areas within London. And as you see here, I've dragged in uh, the uh, London population. So it uh, sums it up to 8.8 .8 million and nothing strange with that. And the way things are done today 
if we, for example, would like to see crimes compared to uh, different regions or uh, areas in London, if we take crimes and drag it in, it will automatically join it. And here I would do a left join. And what we get is, what you all know is data explosion. Because there, are multi there can be multiple crimes per area. So as you see here, now all of a sudden population for this specific area is being counted multiple times. Yes. So if we go back to our uh, workbook, we will see that it jumps from 8.8 .8 million to 168 million. So that is definitely not the population of London. So as, you, as I showed you, like this is a well-known uh, challenge that we have in Tableau today because the way we uh, join tables. Uh, so how do we tackle it at the current state? So yes, we can write a level of detail calculation. If I drag that one in, put it on text, I get my 8.8 .8 million. So instead of doing that, we thought, so how can we uh, make life easier for our, all, all of our analysts and people working with Tableau that want to join data from multiple tables? So if I go to the second uh, worksheet here, I have the exact same thing. But if I go to data source, as you saw, that what I did in the beginning, I double clicked on this one. And this one looks a little, little bit different. So if you look down here, I have my table, and that is the population of London. I have three columns. If I, for example, take crime here and drag it in, I get this thing that we call nullus, basically a relationship builder between two tables. And if I drop it, I get to define the relation between the two tables. So we can do our one, uh, one to many, many to many, one to one relation and so on. And here we have the same thing as we had before when we were joining tables. So the uh, a common key. And if I close it, if I go back to London, you still see I only see the London table. If I click on crimes, I only see the crimes table. So it's not being joined. So it, that will actually be executed at uh, when, we, uh, when we run the uh, query on in the individualization part. But for all those of you that think like, so do I have to redo all my uh, queries? Do I have to rebuild the whole model, everything I've done? No, you do not. Because if I remove this one for a second and double click on this one, I enter the old, what we already had. So it's backward compatible. So if I take crimes, drag it in, then you're kind of familiar. This looks familiar to what you've done before. So you can do both. If you want to enrich a table, you can join it here. So I will remove this one now so I don't get data explosion. And then I can click here, I exit it. And here I can do relationships between tables. So let's say that we take that, we have uh, London population, we have crimes, we go to the relationship to uh, <coughs> workbook, you still, it's still 8.8 .8 million. So pretty good. And there's no problem anymore. Uh, and the thing that you see also that's different on the left side, we've uh, joined together all the values and uh, for example, so here you have tables. So I see my crimes table, I see my London population table. If I extend this one here, uh, I, we have joined in like all the measures and dimensions that exist in the crimes table and same down here. So all the uh, dimensions and the measures. And there's a tiny, tiny line here that's almost impossible to see. But if I take one of the measures and drag it up, you see directly underneath it, you actually see where the border goes between measures and dimensions. So if I drag this one up here, drop it, it will become a dimension, and I will not do that right now. So you have to, so the, the GUI has changed slightly, but for my, my personal opinion is that it's for the better. So what can we do from here? So this one is good now, so I don't get the data explosion. And if I go, for example, to 
look at this one. So this one, <coughs> we this is kind of done the, the old way. And here I can see a uh, scatter plot and I see uh, the average price of houses, I see number of crimes in thousands. So what this one tells me is that we have high number of crimes in, uh, the, uh, in richer areas, in London at least. And so what are we, so if we were to do, if we wanted to filter like on a specific crime type or crime area, there would be, there would, we would have to put a certain amount of effort into it to get it working. In the current, in the 2020.2 and moving forward, we can actually join in different tables now. So I can do something like this. I can say like, okay, I have my crime table. I can select burglary and this one will automatically filter it. Or like what type of, uh, what type of, uh, uh, house is it? Is it like a detached house, is a flat or semi? So in here, I actually have three different tables that are joined together. So if I go back to the to data source in this one, you can see I have, so it's not that one. So yeah, uh, one way to illustrate it is by clicking here and looking at the data behind it. So one second. So if we click on that one and go to there and say, show me. So if I see the full data set here, I will see that the average price, price per capita and population all are in one table in the full data set. If we go to this one and do the same thing, we will actually see three different tables. We have the summary. That's what's what I'm, uh, I have highlighted. We have the crimes table. We have the housing sales and we have the lobby population. So all three are separate tables and, uh, but that are uh, queried at, uh, separately at when I uh, visualize my data. So for me personally, this is definitely a game changer, but at the same time, you have to rethink and have to be uh, uh, how you are modeling the data because all of a sudden we have moved the modeling away from uh, up from the data warehousing and up to the end product. So yeah, be careful when, uh, when do, doing, uh, doing this and because you can get interesting results depending on how you join the data and what you do. So it's not just like uh, we will uh, skip the old way of doing it and just jump to the new one. But, uh, and this is my personal opinion once again, but uh, it's a combination. So if you want to enrich a table, use the old joining of the tables. If you want to have like a, a big data model with multiple tables, fact table and uh, dimensions, then use uh, the uh, relationships. So uh, moving forward, set action. Just a quick recap of uh, what Morton Booth uh, said. So, when, so it, with set actions, if we click on something, as Morton Boo said, like we get proportional brushing over here. Now, if we hold down, for example, control or command on a Mac uh, and select more, we get uh, these ones are adapted and show the proportion of the selected uh, values uh, according to the total. But if we would, for example, to click on here by mistake without holding down control, the whole thing is reset. And that can be, yeah. Yeah, tricky at some point, sometime, sometime. So what we introduced is what Morton Boo covered is set actions where you can in the action actually say that if you highlight this one and it will actually tell you like add it to set. So we're adding it to the set. So I can go to the next one, say add this one to the set as well. Add this one to the set as well. And that way we can actually control. Like, so what are we, and we can click around without actually losing the proportional brushing over here. And if I want to remove it, and I will not show you how it's done behind the scenes because Morton Boo already showed you that. So it's really easy to control it. And this is just a simple sample, but Morton Boo did, he showed you a more advanced uh, uh, ways of doing it. So, it, and just a quick recap of what he did as well is like, 
yeah, we have uh, our uh, visualization here and we have the uh, values over here. If I click on anything, he showed you a drop down. This is a list. So depending on what I click on, they are highlighted over here and they are, so this is set controls. Uh, and uh, we show the proportional brush brushing on the right side. So pretty nice. So moving forward, one thing that I really like, I like maps and Tableau is really good at maps, but uh, before this, we, uh, we had to do like uh, uh, shape files and so on. So with, so this, uh, with 2020.2, we've introduced the uh, integration with Esri. So Esri is a well-known uh, company for doing uh, maps and uh, enriching maps with uh, lots of, uh, with external data. And what you see here is direct uh, integration with Esri uh, just by going to the uh, data source, let's see, data source, and adding a data source that is pointing at a URL at the Azure server that's public. So that's the one. And here I see all the data set, all the tables that exist in this data source. I've uh, uh, included uh, the gar uh, garbage hauler uh, boundaries for uh, the state of Oregon. And what I've dragged in is just the uh, whole name and the shape file for or the shape table for the uh, holders. So if we want to see how that is done, we can just take the shape uh, uh, value, drag it in, and we get the map directly. So as I said, like no more need for uh, external shape files, so on. You can still use them if you want, but this is an easier way. And then if we want to like uh, see, okay, so give me the uh, counties, you can take the county, drag it to color, and it's automatically, uh, automatically shows me the counties in color. Uh, another thing, I don't know how many of you use uh, explain data, uh, but just a small addition to it. Uh, so let's say we have 10 minutes left. If we, uh, for example, want to, so you know when you train data in uh, machine learning, it's really important like what data you're using for the machine, uh, for machine learning, so what, uh, uh, features should, should you include, but not, so uh, what data should be in, what should be not, to get an accurate model as possible. So if you click on this one, for example, so we say, see uh, August is outlier, we have the light bubble over here, and this has been around for a while now, but the new thing now is that you can choose what fields you want to include in the actual uh, model. So we can go in here and say like, okay, so ETL process ID. No, I don't think that one is uh, like uh, really interesting. And uh, corrected uh, record flag is also not interesting. I can remove those, click on it, and it goes out, recalculates the uh, model and everything, and gives me a new visualization. So that's pretty cool. So that way you can actually control what you are using in your uh, in uh, when explaining the data or using explain data or not, what values are being used. So if we quickly jump to another cool feature that I find really interesting is, uh, so in the old, uh, so in Tableau 2020.1 and lower, to publish a workbook, you had to uh, have a desktop basically. So now you can take a workbook and just go to in uh, Tableau uh, Server 2020.2 and higher. You can go to a uh, project, for example, select new, uh, work look up, upload, choose your file and double click on it. You can select what project you want to upload it to. I'll go to that one, uh, upload, and it's uploaded. So no need for uh, Tableau desktop for this specific use case. And there you go, there's my workbook. Uh, another thing that I find really nice is, let's see what it have it. It's metrics. So metrics, as I said in the beginning, is a totally new content type in uh, Tableau. So it builds off a workbook, but it's totally independent. So just to show you, so this is a metric. And this one is basically updated, as you see here, refreshed three hours ago on both. And what it does, it ref uh, so 
based on how you are accessing your data, if it's a live connection or if it's an extract, uh, you can set it to refresh on a certain uh, frequency. So if it's based off a extract, uh, you can uh, trigger it so that it actually refreshes when the extract refreshes, so the number, you're always seeing the latest number on the metric. And on, uh, if you're using a live connection, it will def by default refresh uh, once per hour, uh, but you can change that value using the uh, uh, TSC command. So how do we do a metric? Uh, if we go to a dashboard like this one, for example, uh, if, and if we uh, just highlight this one and say, I want to see my sales numbers up here, you see, I have a new uh, feature called metrics. If I click on that one, I can say, so this is the latest value. So it says 83,000. So if I just go back and highlight that one, it says 84,000, but this one, this one is rounded up. Uh, so this one will always show me the latest number in the uh, series. I can give it a name. Uh, let's say sales. Uh, TUG, uh, what measure I want to use. So I'll use sales at this point, where I want to publish it to, and I say create. And once I've created it, I can just go back and it appears here. So uh, there's my new metric that I created. And just to show you, so I'll, it's kind of hard to uh, demo uh, on a mobile. So this is what it looks like on a mobile. And uh, I can, I always get the latest uh, numbers. So, and the nice thing is this is a KPI built straight out of the box. And when you go into this one, you will see the uh, latest number and you will see the trend. So kind of like the stock ticker on a, uh, on a stock app that you have in your phones. And uh, another thing, that is uh, quite nice is, so this is a really small feature, but yeah, quite useful. So if we have our favorites, we can rearrange them pretty easily now, just by like taking it, dragging it, dropping it. So we can rearrange like the favorites now according to our likings. Uh, also, another thing that we included in this version is in Lineage, prior to 2020.2, we were actually missing uh, dashboards. Now dashboards is included here in Lineage. And Lineage, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, is part of the uh, data management add-on. And it, show, can sh it shows you the, uh, it actually shows you uh, where the data is from, who's using it. So here I can see the, uh, what database, uh, or I can see that this uh, uh, workbook builds off a Excel uh, file. I can see what tables being used, so what sheets in the Excel file. I can see what workbooks use this data source. I can see what sheets are using uh, in what uh, in the workbook are using this, uh, what dashboards are using uh, that data source and so on, and who are who is the actual owner of this one. So really powerful view uh, from, uh, and as I said, this is part of the data management add-on. Uh, the rest of it, I thought I'll just browse through it. So another uh, cool integration uh, besides of S3 is that we now have uh, support for Oracle uh, spatial data. So in Oracle, you can have spatial data uh, stored in tables. Now you can uh, connect to it and use it directly in Tableau. Uh, then. Another nice thing is for those of you using a uh, Tableau mobile app, it's not fully supported, supported Intune, so you can, uh, from the enterprise, so Intune is Microsoft uh, mobile uh, device management uh, tool. And uh, if you're using that, now you can fully control it and the rollout of the uh, app and uh, using Microsoft Intune. Uh, another nice thing is that we've introduced is in prep, uh, prep builder, we now have the sales for uh, connector. And another big thing that's introduced as well is that now we actually have, finally have uh, data refresh uh, as incremental. So you don't have to load the full data every time. Uh, for, this, uh, for the developers, uh, webhooks now have a, uh, when you publish a webhook, 
uh, you can uh, set it to enable disabled, which is really nice. And uh, previously they were always enabled. And uh, through the REST APIs, now you can programmatically export a workbook uh, as a PDF, which is also a nice uh, addition. Uh, for, what is it? Yeah, so this is a big one, uh, at least like, so some of the commands in TSM, uh, you can now execute them without having to restart the whole set. For example, when you uh, do, when you change the logging level, uh, when you apply it, uh, it's applied without having to restart the whole Tableau server, which is a really nice move in the right direction, uh, if you ask me. And uh, with that said, I have two minutes left and uh, I would just like to say thank you all for listening. And uh, if you're not part of, if you're curious like on what's uh, around the corner in Tableau and what uh, we are about to release, what's coming like in the next release, uh, you can always uh, subscribe to uh, the coming soon feature releases. So the beta testing program that you will have. So tableau.com slash products uh, slash coming soon. Uh, and if you want to see, for example, all the features listed in 2020.2, go to tableau.com slash 2020-2 features. And just a quick reminder, uh, e-learning, uh, Tableau e-learning is free to the end of June. So uh, if you haven't, if you missed that, you can just sign up and use that full uh, Tableau e-learning uh, until the end of June. Uh, so uh, if you haven't done that, please go ahead and do that. And having that said, thank you for me and uh, Stockholm signing out. Um, I think I don't think you're going to get off the hook that quickly, Andrea. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> there's there's a there's a question from uh, from Peter. So asking, yeah. can I go from physical joins to logical without removing the tables? So from physical joins to without removing the tables. So uh, let me show you. So I think we have means on old connections. On so existing. So, yeah, on existing connections. Can you upgrade them to the new relationship model without adding and re uh, removing and adding them? So no, they are preserved as they are because we don't want to break. So if we were taking the step and just said like, yeah, we'll upgrade everything. And a lot of, uh, yeah, dashboard would have broken. So we kind of kept it as it is. And as you see here, if I go into this one, this is uh, the old way of doing it and uh, which will still exist and all, all the way forward. So this is enriching a table, but uh, there's no way of just like skipping it. So if you want to do it to the, uh, do the relationships, then yeah, you would have to take out the, the uh, table and re-add it. So for example, like uh, take this one, remove it, go in here, and there you go. And before you do it, before you publish anything, test it first. That's always my like number one advice for everybody, always test to see Will it work or not, like uh, the way it's supposed to? And because, yeah, you understand, like, so now we have two tables. So the, the, uh, when you add your uh, uh, measures and dimensions, uh, prior everything was named the same, but uh, yeah, uh, test it. But no, it's not a forceful upgrade to, uh, to uh, the neural assaulted relationships. I have a question then. I guess I don't have yeah. to chat because I, I've already talked uh, once or twice. Um, You're not allowed to ask questions, Mortimer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, in the old, before relationships were introduced, uh, we had from 2018.3 and forward, we had the ability to do multi-table extracts, which was uh, basically a precursor to this, I guess. Um, yep. If we have an old school type of um, joint relationship, can we still allow that to be multi-table extracts? Because obviously in relationships, uh, it's by default multi-table, that's how they work. But if you have a regular join in the, uh, yeah, in the, in the old way of joining, uh, does that still support uh, multi-table extracts? Because I have a lot of uh, security settings that is hooked into that basically. Yeah. Does that make sense? 
uh, yeah, definitely makes sense. And uh, on top of my mind, I, I know that I have seen it and I have been informed of how it works, but it slipped my mind. So I have, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll test it myself at some point. Yeah. It's, just, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's relevant it's a, because... It's it a really be... relevant question and a really interesting question. So uh, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll get back to you on that one. And there's also one asking if they can get links to the Tableau workbooks. I can post mine in the chat. I guess you can do the same. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll fix that. Tobias, any more questions? I was muted, sorry. I have one question. Uh, can What license types can use and define the metrics function? Is that available for viewers as well? So they can view it always, but yeah. uh, so, uh, and because this is actually modifying, so uh, top of my head, I think it's explorers and creators that can create them, but a viewer, I don't think, and don't take me my word for it now, okay. I don't think that a viewer can create a metric at the moment. All right, so I'll check. Yeah. And yeah, for the uh, uploading workbook uh, that I mentioned, uh, you have to have the publisher uh, permission to upload a workbook. Okay, uh, we are running out of time and I really do appreciate uh, all that you have uh, taught us today, both Martin and Andrija. We really do appreciate. And uh, just, I, I, I tried typing down, I don't know whether the attendees have seen that, we really like to know what you like us to cover next time so that we just do not come up with topics, but come up with topics that you actually would prefer to hear about. So please feel free to, uh, to share with us on that note. And then um, if someone else has a question, please feel free to type it in. Otherwise we will close the session. Okay, Caroline, please. Thanks, everyone.